Hello, and thanks for checking out the service. I'm Kathleen, the Outreach Director here, and I'd like to say thank you for joining us and being a part of what we're doing here online. My family's been attending the journey for about nine years, and we've seen it go through a lot of changes. But one thing that has never changed is our love for each other. So if you have a need or you need to pray with someone, please let us know. We want to be a community of support for each other. For each one of these services, we have to start with worship. I hope that even from your couch, you're taking this opportunity to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Worship puts us in the right frame of mind, and that's why we do it first. It proclaims who God is, what He's done, what He will do. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So if you have breath today, join us in praising Him with our worship team. Let's just continue right now to give God the credit and the honor and the attention he deserves. He is mighty, he is good, and he is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. You never 
change your compassion won't fail me as you have been you forever will be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed your hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness put unto me last one great is sing great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed your hand has provided great is thy faithfulness That hymn comes from Lamentations 3, 22 to 23, which says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I don't know about you, but I'm needing his mercies a lot right now. Thankfully, he gives new mercy every morning. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the blessing of getting to worship you this morning. I know these times are difficult for a lot of people. There's so much uncertainty in the world and so many people have lost jobs and are struggling to find new jobs. As a church, we've committed to love Nova and to do all that we can to care for our friends and neighbors in Northern Virginia. Each week, we've been accepting curbside donations so that we can deliver groceries to those in need. So far, we've been able to provide groceries to about 70 families. To learn more about this program, please visit the Love Nova tab on our website. Finally, we wanna thank those who give so faithfully to the journey. God has blessed our church. We know that the reason God blesses us is so that we can be a blessing to others. So thank you for giving. And if you want to know more about how you can give, you can visit thejourneynova.org slash give or the notes section of this video. I hope you've made the time to read through the book of James. It happens to be my favorite book of the Bible. Let's go to Chad right now for week two of our study on the book of James entitled Reboot. Hello, Journey Church. Thanks for being with us today and every week. We appreciate you joining us online. Hey, before I begin, I wanted to let you know, starting this week, brand new carpet is being laid in our building. Now, if you remember, two of the items our end of year offering was going towards was new paint and new carpet. Now, the painting has been done, but this week they're laying new carpet in the lower level of our building, and the following week, new carpet will be laid upstairs. So I have a special invitation for 25 of you. Again, space is limited to just 25 people. Next Sunday, you are invited to attend our worship service, not in your home, but at the journey. We'll, we'll watch the 9 a.m. service together on the big screens. And then, this is the best part, you will stay and serve our church by helping move some furniture around. <laughs> Let's be honest, you have not had a better invitation in four months. We do have a few rules though. First, if you sign up, you must stay and help. This is not an invitation to come, watch the service, then go home. Second, this is not for families unless your family unit has older kids who would like to use their muscles. Uh, we'll be moving all kinds of stuff, so having kids running around won't work, and, and we honestly will have no space for them to just sit either. So basically I'm saying no kids, and I'm sure that makes me the meanest human in the world. I promise it's for safety purposes only. Third, you need a good back, some muscles, ingenuity, a good drill, all those things are helpful. Which means some of you dudes, you need to stay home and send your wife because this describes her more than you. 
Uh, we're looking for anyone who has the ability to help us to come. Fourth, all that CDC stuff, yeah, same for us. Uh, if you're sick or if you've been st sick lately, stay home. If you're immune compromised, stay home. Uh, if you're coming back from Myrtle Beach this week, please stay home. Uh, we want to protect everyone. And then finally, you must wear a mask the whole time you are inside, even during the service. No questions asked. No masky, no helpy, okay? That's the deal. So if you're able to help out, take a moment and click the sign up button on the screen for this opportunity. And join us as we hang out for a few moments next Sunday morning. And uh, you'll also get a chance to be like my kids and make fun of me while we watch the service together. I hope you'll join us. Oh, okay, so, so back to the important stuff. This week, we continue our series called Reboot. Now, as you can see, the image we are using is of two extension cords. Now, sometimes to get our lives back on track, to, to be able to move forward again after tough times, to, to take next steps towards Jesus, we have to unplug and, and plug back in to reboot our system. My hope and prayer is that this series will do just that. It will help us take our next steps towards Jesus in a time where we need a good rebooting. Last week, we started the series by talking about how tough times in life will come, and, and we have to understand we can endure them if we trust God to lead us through them. But this week, it's like James is alive right now, writing the words we're going to look at today because this might be the biggest reboot all of us need. I've shared in the past that the average person says about 16,000 words every single day. Now, that may be the reality for most people, but, but no matter whether we say 500 words a day for our extra introverted or 50,000 a day for our extra wordy people, there's a good chance no matter how many words we do say, we're going to say words we regret. You call me crazy, uh, but I'm pretty sure every one of us who are watching today have said some words we regret over the last four months of this pandemic. Maybe they were words you said to a good friend, someone you're dating, or maybe we're dating. Maybe you said something to your spouse, your kids, a neighbor. Uh, maybe you said words you regret to a worker at a restaurant or an employee at a local store. I'm guessing you've said some things you regret in the last few months, and I'm, and I'm also betting you will say some words today and beyond you'll regret too. This week, we're going back to the book of James to look at a passage that gives us some insights into how we can reboot our words and, and hopefully stay away from those regrets. Let's start by looking at James 1.19. Here's what James says. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. We aren't sure of the context for why James writes these words, but it's probably connected to this new thing called the church. At the time James writes these words, the church is about nine years old, so it, it's still in the baby stage. Now, when the church began then, there were about 120 people who were a part of it. But then a few days later, Peter preaches this message and 3,000 people said, we're all in and they were baptized. Uh, this church has been growing exponentially since till this time where we see James write these words. Uh, kind of give you an example here. If you've been at the journey for a couple of years, you know we've had some, some crazy growth. In fact, last year we saw a 22% growth rate over increase over 2018. That's really big, but this early church, it saw like a growth rate of like 22 bazillion percent. So James and all these new leaders in that church were trying to figure things out. Now, they're actually leading this new religious movement that would later come to be known as Christianity. So you know there had to be a lot of conflict going on. So we find these leaders attempting to help not just end the tension in people's relationships, but to also help these new followers of Jesus see how they can live a better life by dealing with these tensions. In our last series, Upside Down, we talked about conflict. When we talked about being peacemakers, this week I want to expand a bit on the conflict piece because, again, I'm sure it's an issue for many of us right now. It's the tension that we have. Now, now please know, we, we can have conflict in our lives and deal with it well, but for most of us, we don't handle it well at all, which, which leaves us with, with many, many regrets. 
So James starts out by writing, be quick to listen and slow to speak. But we like to live differently. We like to reverse James's words and are slow to listen and quick to speak. When we live that way, guess what shows up? Conflict. Let me talk a bit more about conflict this week. When we have conflict with someone else, there are two things happening. First, we want the other person to hear us before we hear them. We don't have the time to listen to them. We don't have the time to let them go first. We, we, we just kind of want them to hear what, what we have to say from the start. Second, we want the other person to understand us because, I mean, let's face it, we have all the answers and we're always right. Even if what we share has no facts involved and it's all opinion, which is about every post online these days. You see, when there's conflict in a relationship, both parties want to be heard and understood. We want to make sure we get our point across first. And so what do we do? We listen slowly and talk quickly. But James says, if you want to be heard and understood, listen quickly. Listen to what they have to say first. Listen to their words, their explanations, their thoughts, their facts, their opinions. Listening should be the first thing we do. How many times this week did you talk first in a conversation when you should have listened first? Probably a few times. Uh, by the way, this is not just for our face-to-face -face moments, but also when we're online. Now, now, don't get me wrong, I get it. We want to be heard and understood, but we actually forget to listen to the other person. Or we forget to even ask that person questions more before throwing in our thoughts. Here's an idea. When you want to talk quickly and listen slowly, the first thing to do is stop. Close your mouth. Listen. But then don't throw out all your opinions and facts. Ask them questions. Ask them to clarify what they said or meant. Ask them to tell you why they're thinking that way. Let them talk. Let them be heard. Let them explain and then try to understand where they're coming from. In our culture, I think we have been trained to think whoever talks loudest is the most important. Whoever makes the most noise must have the most to say. So we live our own lives that way. We figure if we talk first, people will think we're, we're important or that we have the most to say. So, so we're quick to talk and slow to listen. Now, I also believe we like to talk first for another reason. Conflict for most people isn't about listening it's not about understanding, it's about being right. No matter who we are, we want to be right every time, even if we're wrong, we don't care. Yet here's James attempting to teach and oversee this big church in Jerusalem that keeps expanding, and he's saying stop trying to be right and start listening, wait to speak. Ask questions so you can understand the other person. Be, be quick to listen and slow to speak. And, and he's saying this because the people who are listening to him, but followers of Jesus. And he wants to remind them, this is how followers of Jesus should act. But, but that's not all James says in, in verse 19, is it? Look at the rest of it. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Gotta love how James adds in that anger piece because it makes so much sense. If I'm quick to listen and someone else, to someone else and, and slow to speak, if I'm working to understand them, guess how angry I become? Not very angry at all. Now we may not agree, but if we work to understand, it helps us stay away from the conflict we find. However, when I'm quick to speak and slow to listen, the result almost every single time is anger. When we don't feel like that person is listening to our words or they can't understand what we're saying because we're giving our thoughts and our opinions first, we get mad. So we blurt out phrases like, why aren't you listen to, listening to, to what I'm telling you? Why don't you understand what I'm saying to you? I know I'm right. Look at my facts. This is what I know and this is what is true. <laughs> and again, this can happen face to face or as is more prevalent now, it happens online. So anger becomes a result of our inability to be quick to listen and slow to speak. But anger 
is also a decision we make. When there's a conflict between me and someone else, there are usually two sides attempting to be heard and understood, and, and it's just a bunch of noise. But that noise is a decision we've made. It's something we can control, but we don't. It reminds me of one of our neighbors in our neighborhood. They live across the street from us on a pipe stem. Now, they have two dogs that basically stay outside all the time inside their fence. I'm not sure what kind of dogs they are, but one's really big and one's really small. Now, the small dog is what I like to call a yapper dog. And that little dog just yaps all the time. It never shuts up. It's never quiet. The only time it gets quiet is when I think it's shock collar buzzes it. I'll hear a ton of yapping, then a yeep, like it, like it just got shocked, but, but I'm not sure the shock collar is on the right level because it takes forever for it to actually go off. My point is, when both parties are yapping like yapper dogs back and forth, no one gets heard or understood. At that point, we both let loose. We both blow up. We both sound like yapper dogs who, who need the level on our shock collars adjusted. It's why when we go online and respond to someone's post we don't agree with, or when we post something we have strong feelings about, the outcome is usually conflict. In fact, one of my favorite posts people make online says something like this. I'm getting ready to post something here that many of you will not agree with, but if you don't agree with me, please don't comment on my post. Uh, hello? <laughs> by, by putting that disclaimer on your post, you, you think those yapper dogs are going to stay away? You think they're going to read what you wrote and internally say something like, why? They're so correct. I, I do not agree at all with what they have posted, but I will not post a response to their incorrectness. It doesn't work that way. The other yapper dogs get out of the yard and go to town. The anger is released. The problem is many times this anger comes from us being misinformed. We draw conclusions about details we know nothing about or, or something where we just know part of the story. We don't look to clarify where that person is coming from or, or the information they may, sh may be sharing or, or why they feel the, the way they do about us or someone else about some topic. We don't care about any of that. Instead of listening first, instead of being slow to speak, we run straight into anger. Let me talk to the married folks watching today because I know you need to hear this. And I know you need to hear this because I need to hear this. I mean, this pandemic has put a strain on many relationships, but I think marriages are feeling it more than other relationships. BC, before COVID, we could come and go, we could take a break if needed, and for some marriages, you needed the, those reprieves by going to work or heading to the gym or, or just getting out and hanging with friends. Uh, but then you were stuck in your home for months, every day with the same person, the same routine, nothing changing. That could be taxing on a relationship. That, that can begin to breed bitterness. That can impact your marriage relationship, especially if that relationship isn't too healthy to begin with. Next thing you know, conflicts begin to arise. Small at first, socks aren't picked up, the toast is burnt, someone used my tools and didn't put them back, someone is pulling all the covers off me at night. But then those conflicts begin to grow into something bigger. The real tensions show up and, and you have your side of the story. You're right and they're wrong. You have your facts. You have your opinions about the relationships. Now you have conflict, which probably brings anger. Can I tell you one of the best ways to deal with conflict in your marriage, and honestly, to reboot your marriage right now, is to take these three steps James shares. If you can be quick to listen, slow to speak, you will become slow to anger, and you will be able to reboot your marriage and really any relationship you're in. Now then James adds these words in verse 21. He says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now James begins by saying, get rid of all moral filth. 
That, that phrase in the Greek language, which is what the New Testament is written in, literally means, and when I use that term literally, I mean literally. So literally in the Greek, it means to take off your clothes, to throw them aside. Now, thankfully, you all are at home, and if you decided to take this literally literal, you can do that and not cause any problems, okay? But then he adds in that next part, get rid of all moral filth. Filth here is a medical term. As you can imagine, there wasn't much in the way of hygiene in those days. Uh, this term James uses refers to the buildup of wax in the ears. For those of the, you with, with kids, it seems like at least once or twice in their lives, they, they come to you and say they can't hear. You know, it feels, feels like something's stuck in my ear. Now, hopefully it's not because they stuck a bean in their ear or an M&M. Now, usually, you, if you go and you grab a Q-tip tip and you stick it in their ear and move it around a bit and then pull it out, right? And about the moment you pull it out, what do they scream? I can hear again. You, on the other hand, are about to throw up due to what you now see on that Q-tip. And, and now you fully understand why they lost the ability to hear. James tells the listeners, again, literally, throw out the wax in your life. What he means is get rid of anything that takes your eyes off of Jesus. Get rid of anything that keeps you from following Jesus. Get rid of anything that stops your ears from hearing from God. Get rid of anything that makes you speak too quickly, that makes you listen too slowly, that gets you angry too fast. Clean out your ears figuratively. Throw away the yapping around you and now listen. Here's what he says next. He says, get rid of all moral filth and accept the word planted in you. James wants people who follow Jesus to specifically listen to God. James is like, look, you know this stuff. We've talked about it before. You've heard me say it and other teachers say it. You've, you've even lived it out in some of your, your life. He reminds them this teaching, these ideas, they have been planted in them just like a seed planted into the ground. See, we think, I need to be heard, I need to be right, and James reminds them and us, no, you need to clean out your ears, and the first thing you do after that is listen to God. We talked about this last week. Seek out wisdom from God first. Let God be the guide for your conversation. Stop yapping and let God lead you to listen. If we do this, James shares with us a promise an outcome from living our lives this way. Look at the end of verse 21. It says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. James wants followers of Jesus to know that when they live their lives in this way, when they listen quickly, speak slowly, or slow to anger, when they understand the other person, when they ask questions, when they get rid of the wax and listen to God, it will save them. Now, I don't think the saving James is talking about is eternal life. I think James is talking about saving things like your marriage. How many times would you like to take those words back? How many times would you like to roll back that anger? How many times when you look back at moments in your marriage have you found... You didn't fully understand what was going on because you jumped to conclusions and you spoke first. I think James is talking about saving your dating relationships. How many times have your words ended a relationship? How, how many times has your anger broken that bond? I think James wants to save your relationship with your kids. At parents, we can say some of the worst things to our kids, no matter whether they are 10 years old or 55 years old. Would you like to save that fractured relationship because you know you have been too slow to listen and really quick to speak? I think James is saying, do you want to save your job, your online connections, your friendships? You want to reboot all of these relationships? It's pretty simple. If you are a follower of Jesus, accept what God has implanted in you. And if you do, and you, you follow that lead, guess what? You have the potential to save those relationships that are so important to you. Look, can, can we be honest? You know the right thing to do. 
You know the right way to act. You know the right way to listen, to speak, to deal with anger. But we so often forget to live that knowledge out. Your mouth will get you in trouble. My mouth has gotten me in trouble many times, but it doesn't have to. Stop trying to be heard first and understood in your way. Stop trying to always be right. Reboot what comes out of your mouth by taking James' words to heart. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Let's pray. God, we want to have strong relationships, yet so often we get in the way of them. We like to speak our mind. We like to say what we think, yet all we do is bring about conflict, and with that conflict comes anger, and with that anger comes brokenness. My prayer for all of us today is we can clean out our ears, get rid of the sin we carry into our relationships, and learn to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because by living this out with your guidance, we can reboot our words. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks again for being with us. I I do hope you will sign up to join me next Sunday and also join me in reading through James chapter 2 through this version reading plan. Now, I'll actually start on Wednesday this week to piggyback on the James 1 reading, which was, I think, nine days. I also hope some of you are reading the whole book of James weekly too, like I am. That has been so, so helpful. But right now, we get a chance to celebrate communion together. Communion is a simple act, but it has huge implications. Jesus took just two simple things, bread and wine, and he created an opportunity for us to connect with him. A chance for us to regularly remember and dwell on what he did for us. Maybe today your family needs to pause for a moment and have a conversation about what communion means. Communion is our opportunity to not only remember Jesus, but to declare what we believe about what his sacrifice means for each of us. So take this opportunity to share with your family what Jesus' gift of his death on the cross means to you personally. Then together, when you're ready, take communion. Jesus took the bread and told his followers to do this in remembrance of him. So let's take it together, remembering how his body was broken for us. Jesus also took the cup and told us to drink this in remembrance of him. So together we drink, remembering that his blood was shed for us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the blessing of getting to do church together. Thank you for the blessing of technology, that we can do church together still. Lord, I pray for unity for your church, that in this weird time where we have to be more separated, that you would bind us together in a beautiful and unique way. And thank you for your mercies that we need more and more, especially right now. Would you give us the blessing of new mercies every morning? Thank you for the blessing of the body. Be with us this week. Help us to be just a unified group in loving you and serving your people. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Thanks for being a part of our service. I hope that you are both encouraged and challenged. I want to invite you to join our live stream services, which happen every Sunday at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. The platform we use allows us to interact through a public chat have private prayer chats, and you'll be able to find out about announcements and events that are happening at The Journey. Be sure to check out the notes section of this video for important information and links, and we hope that we can see you online soon.